Hey guys, this is Ethan with Fish Mania. So today we went to the Chattanooga Area Aquatic Society Club meet uh, and we heard the most impressive 14, 15, sorry, 15 year old kid talk about, well, actually I'll just let him take it. Alrighty, so today I'm here with who I like to call the catfish kid, but he goes by the catfish den. What's your name, man? Sean. Sean, Sean is the most amazing 14 year old? I just turned 15. 15 year old, sorry. 15 year old that I have ever met in my entire life in this fish hobby. Um, he breeds, well, why don't you tell us? What do you breed? So I breed catfishes, specifically driftwood catfishes. Very nice. Like your honeycomb cats and your galaxy wood cats. Galaxy wood cats, very, very cool. Do you breed anything else besides those? Um, Plecos, some Corydoras, and I've recently begun getting into Epistogramma. Epistogramma, very, very nice. What species of Epistos? A lot. I went from <laughs> zero Epistos to 11 different species in about two months. 11 different species, and all of them you've bred? No. No. Um, I've bred two of them. Two species so far, but we are shooting for all 11. Theoretically. Yeah. Theoretically. <laughs> You sound like young Sheldon. That's fantastic, man. Um, so here's my question. Uh, today we're talking about wood catfish. Okay. What are you excited to talk about? I'm excited to share more on them. I actually got to do a talk at the All Aquarium Catfish Convention. Oh, very ago, cool. But I only got a 10 minute window to speak. So uh -huh. I'm just really excited to be able to share more information. That's right, that's right. And you you literally are amazing to so many people and very, very talented in the hobby. What do you think makes your breeding different? Um, I've... It, wood cats are very understudied and underbred, so I feel like I've had very few resources to work off of, and I started from, I've always said treat them like a discus, because discus are regarded as very sensitive fish, and since I got my first wood cats, I've always treated them like a discus, and now I've bred a pile. And why should people keep wood cats? Um, something unique, more variety it's all plecos and quarries you never see any new things and i really feel like those more unique fish especially the ones you just don't see and it's not like they're dull in color they're beautiful and they're so unique that it's just something you should keep on sure sure so i guess um here's a good question what when you look at them is it just like that spaced out dumb look or what what is it that you absolutely love about a wood cat they look like Sid the Sloth to me. <laughs> <laughs> They're, I don't know, it just, they have big eyes and yeah. some of them, they just have that comic look. They don't even look real. They're so cool, man. You know, yeah. most kids your age are playing video games or um, playing football and you said, you know what? No, I'm gonna create an absolute catfish empire. That was your goal. You said, I am the catfish emperor and that is me. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. It, all I do is fish. That's constant. amazing, and I love that. So we're gonna listen to you talk today, um, and we're really excited, and I guess let's get into it. Okay, hello, my name is Sean, and today I'm going to be speaking on driftwood and catfishes. Okay, so essentially I brought some fish, and I'm going to talk about them, how to breed them, etc. cetera. Um, that's about it. I'm gonna give them away at the end. Okay, so I'm only 15. I remote school, which allows me to do fish all day, every day. And I'm the owner of thecatfishden.com. You can see me at Star Jumpers Tank on the weekends. I'm always there. And I'm catfishologist and an editor on plantcatfish.com. Also, I was a speaker at the All Aquarium Catfish Convention. And here's a couple links. Okay, so what are wood cats? Wood cats generally are smaller fish. And there's roughly 150 described species, with many more being described. So there's a good number of species that are really good for aquarium life, and then there is a number that are not. Now, these fish that are not, I'm going to cover. Make sure that everyone knows what they are so that you can avoid making the mistakes that I have. <laughs> now, a bit of taxonomy here. Aconipteridae is the family. That's taxonomy, kingdom, phylum, class, genus, species, whatever. Family of Ocnipteridae, that's below catfishes, it's a family. They branch that family out into two subfamilies. 
Centromopolinae, and Achenipteridae, each of which have a handful of genera and over 50 described species, and they're only found in South America. Now, the family of Achenipteridae, the subfamily of Centromopolinae, and then the genus Tatia. There is roughly 20 described species in the genus Tatia, and there's many, many undescribed species. Here's a handful that I keep, including Tatia galaxius, which is a very common name that you may see on the internet. However, it's not a common fish at all. Uh, Tatia intermedia is actually what they say Tatia galaxius is. The galaxy woodcat is intermedia. I do keep galaxias, however, I am the only known keeper of them in the world. Tatia strigata is another extraordinarily rare fish. I'm one of believed to be two or three at the very most keepers of these in the United States. Mine are, to my knowledge, the only ones that are breeding currently in the world. However, they have not yet produced any viable eggs. In the Tatia world. Tatia gyrena is another cool one. However, they're, they live up to the name woodcat. They hide all the time and they're quite bland in color. And then as well as this species, Tatia simplex, the actual fish here is Tatia affiliated simplex, which is an undescribed species. And the only person that keeps these, these are actually found in the Rio Jingu, where zebra plecos are found. So they like warmer temperatures and they're not exported commonly. I feel like the scientists were making fun of the fish when they named it simple. <laughs> I don't know if that's due to the pattern or what, but... It's very simple. The names are, <laughs> yeah, the names are quite simple. I don't know, some of them, as you'll see later, are a bit more complicated. Okay, back to the taxonomy here. You have the family of Achenipteridae, the subfamily of Centromopolinae, and then here's a new genus, Duranglanus. Now, I actually keep every described species of Duranglanus, the most common of which would be the honeycomb cat, which I actually brought a group here today to give away. These only get up to about two inches and they're really popular. The other two described species are Duranglanus alta, the lightning wood cat. These are a lot rarer. They're only found in one river in Colombia, which isn't very commonly collected in. And Duranglanus romani, the Roman's wood cat, is also found in Colombia and it's not commonly collected. I'm lucky enough to have all of these and all are actively breeding, some of which in quantities of many hundred. Wow. Now, here's a quick little woodcat cheat sheet. So, I've broken Achenipteridae down into three separate categories. Species for everyone, species to avoid, and then species just to not even mess with. So, for someone that's new to woodcats, it, things can be quite complicated as there's a lot of fish. Species that are okay include Tatia intermedia, the galaxy woodcat, which I brought some of today. Achenipterichthys coracoides, the Zamora catfish, which you'll see up here in the top left-hand corner. That is actually an individual that I had a couple years ago and I ended up bringing that one to Ethan when I couldn't care for it anymore. Um, during Lattice Perugia, the honeycomb cat, arguably the most common wood cat to find in the aquarium hobby, as well as Trachylaeictus exilis, which is known as the pygmy wood cat. Here's some species to avoid. Agonesis. I don't know if it's pronounced Agonesis. I have some British friends that pronounce it Agonesis, so I'm not exactly sure. I do not speak Latin. Uh, Duckbills. Most Agonesis species are 6 to 10 inches long, however, there is one species that is almost 2 feet in length. These should be avoided just due to their sheer size and the fact that they are very slow to feed, and most people that have a tank big enough to house them normally have very fast predatory fish. And they're also very hard to feed. They do not eat pellets. Uh, occasionally you can find one trained on frozen. Most of the time they only eat live food. They're also caught on rod and reel occasionally in the wild. So you'll find them with damage and sometimes they get infections on their upper lip. Tracky tracky, because I'm not going to pronounce this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is a very large species that gets up to around 18 inches. And they're actually pretty commonly imported, but I have avoided them due to their sheer size. And most people that have a tank, you know, probably 125 or more gallons, will, they're just, they're so slow to eat that almost anything outcompetes them. And they, to have a 125 just for one, you know, just one dark fish, it makes no sense. Also, Centromopolis heckali, this one, these are not very popular. They're actually found in a really common area to collect in Iquitos, Peru. However, they're not imported due to the fact that they're constantly swimming. 24 hours a day, they do not stop, kind of like sharks. And 
Because of that, they can bump into aquarium walls, severely hurt themselves, and the couple of people I've talked to that have kept them haven't really kept them more than four or five months, and they don't have major success. Also, any undescribed species, this is more the fact that there is almost no data on the undescribed species, so I would rather someone that's new to keeping wood cats keep something like Tachi Intermedia, where there's articles upon articles on them. Another reason for the undescribed species is people like me or other breeders that specialize in wood cats would rather have the capability to get those, just for the sake of science and to actually breed them and spread them out further. Also, here's some species to leave in the wild. Astrophysis batrachis, the gulper catfish. These are pretty common, you see them in stores a lot. However, they are, in my opinion, the most sensitive freshwater fish. More sensitive than discus, more sensitive than anything you can name. Solely because of the fact that they are so sensitive to all disease that almost nothing will not affect them. And they come in with all sorts of weird things. They get a strain of what looks like Icarapostylus, but it's neither. It's only to them. They cannot transmit it. And the ones that don't die of that end up having weird bacterial issues. Uh, the group that I had, I prepared for a year before I even purchased them, just to make sure that I had the perfect setup possible. Mine ended up getting Aramonis sobrio, which is a bacterial problem. And that was pretty much uncurable. We tried professional vets, multiple medications, and it just did not work. So at the end of the day, they perished after two years of keeping them, which by my research is a massive number. Most people fail to keep them for a week or even a month. Um, I know one person that's kept one for seven years, and to my knowledge, that's the longest on record. Two years is a very long time, and it's just, for the fish's sake, it's not worth keeping them. Same thing with the Tetranematictus wallacei, the wallace is shoehead. I got some of these at CatCon. Um, they were really cool fish, however, they had a feeding problem. They only ate live food. They wouldn't even eat frozen bloodworms, live blackworms, only live fish or shrimp. Now, ghost shrimp were really hard to find in Huntsville, so I had to resort to fish. I prefer not to use feeder guppies as they're not very hardy. So, I kind of thought, okay, if these are South American fish, what tiny little fish is from South America? And the only thing that, first thing, cheapest thing that popped into my head was neon tetras. <laughs> and that, that worked very well. Um, however, <laughs> however, one five inch Wallace's shoe head eats 100 neon tetras per month. And when you have a group of four of them, and you don't actually have a professional job, and you have to buy 400 neon tetras a month, they very quickly become unsustainable financially. And they're also very sensitive. So I just do not recommend keeping them. Another duckbill, Tympanophlera species. I actually keep some of these. However, the reason I advise not to keep them at all is because of just how sensitive they are. They almost never acclimated to captivity. Mine stayed in a quarantine tank for four months before I could even get them to eat frozen bloodworms. They would only eat live blackworms, and with those being harder and harder to find for me, I struggled to feed them. And quite honestly, they're just so sensitive that I would not recommend getting them. Also, I'm not gonna cover this one very long, but uh, Pseudoacnipteris, so Pinodosis. These are actually found in brackish and sometimes fully marine scenarios in estuaries and sometimes on the border of the river there. But they also get to eight inches long and to replicate an environment where they go from fully fresh to fully marine water annually is very difficult, especially for a fish of that size. Thankfully, they're not commonly imported. I would just recommend going by this and if you really do want to keep one of these species, do your research and be very careful. Woodcat safety. I cannot press this more. Woodcats will wedge themselves everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Your filter intake, I've had them jump in UV sterilizers. Your plecos cave, do not keep these with most plecos. I keep them with plecos, but on very specific conditions. Mutual destruction occurs when they are in the tank with the pleco. They go into the cave that the pleco wants to live in, and the pleco locks their spines and it's never good. Um, so just be very cautious with it. There are companies that make caves that can actually break apart if there's any issues. I've been very thankful to have those caves on multiple occasions, but I would just advise against it. Lids are necessary. Um, most species don't really jump when unprovoked, but the Tatia Intermedia Galaxy would catch um, this morning when I was catching that bag out and I dumped the cave out, they were kind of popping, like out of the water. <laughs> yeah, so I just might as well keep a lid on your tank, even if it's just a piece of plastic, something to prevent carpet surfing. P. 
pH matters. These are South American fish. They really only like soft, acidic water. Anything that's neutral or slightly acidic is required. Basic water does not work for these fish for long term. Um, you gotta respect your temperature requirements. Most of them fall between 76 to 80. Some species like my affiliated simplex from the Jingu require very hot temperatures, but most scenarios you have to make sure that you're not keeping them. I don't know of a species that can go down in the 71, 72 range. Also, food wood cats can be very hard to feed and condition, so you just have to be very careful when purchasing them. I recommend purchasing from breeders because most of the time they're weaned on the pellet and flake foods. Also, this is how I've always put wood cats into my brain, is that wood cats and discus come from the same area, South America. Most of the rivers, I believe, they're found in the same place. And if something is safe for a discus, which are usually regarded as sensitive fish, then it's safe for a wood cat. When I got my first wood cats, I had that mindset, and every wood cat I get, I still have that mindset. They like the soft water, they like ultra clean water, ultra sterilized, and that is the key to keeping wood cats successfully. Um, if you ever need help with any questions on wood cats, uh, either get in touch with me, Salt Planet Catfish, or one of the other breeders that are famous for wood cats. Now, thank you to my sponsors, including myself, the Catfish Den, and Star Jumpers Tank. Okay, so. The wood cats that I brought. These will be Tatia Intermedia, the Galaxy Wood Cat, and during Bonus Bruge, the Honeycomb Wood Cat. These are actually half the size of these, it just doesn't look that way. They're both very easy to keep, and there's very few requirements to keeping them. Here is a very simple care requirement chart. So, Intermedia, since they're a little bit bigger, I recommend a 20 gallon tank for a small group. And uh, honeycombs, you can get by with a 10, that's what I breed them in. PH target. I usually do 6.8, but they would love it at 6. They'd like it at 7. It really doesn't matter. Just keep it slightly acidic. Hardness. About 100 TDS. Don't have ultra hard water. 300 TDS. That's insane numbers for these fish. 150 is fine. They spawn in that. But anywhere around 100 is good. Temperature, again, it really varies by species. These two both stay around the 76 to 82 range. They don't spawn as much at higher temperatures. Most of the time I breed them at 78, but I currently have groups in tanks that are at 82. Uh, furniture, very different for the two species. Tatia intermedia is an egg scatterer, which means they would lay their eggs in plants in the wild. So I have mostly bare bottom tanks, especially with my wood cats because they like ultra sanitized water. And the only way for me to get plants or a substitute that's very clean is a spawning mop. I hand make my own spawning mops and that I started because of the intermediates. Honeycombs on the other hand actually spawn in the back of the caves. Both species I recommend keeping caves with as they will rest in them during the day. However, it's not as much of a requirement as it is for honeycombs. Spawning conditioning. I do frozen blood worms. They're easy, they're cheap, and I can get them in by the pound. Versus something like pellets and flakes might not as high, might not have as high of a protein content. And high protein is required to get these fish to spawn, as it is for most species. Are they surface or bottom feeders? Well, woodcats technically are both. Now, the very rabid females usually kind of sink to the bottom. Um, but they will eat off both, so if all you feed is flakes, don't really worry, they'll be just fine. Uh, in a community scenario, Tati Intermedia is a very fast species and they are voracious predators. They will attack almost any piece of food that gets in that tank, versus honeycombs are just the same way, but they're a little bit slower, and they can be outcompeted. So I would just be cautious with what tank makes you place them. Okay, so for breeding, this is a pretty simple, Concept: The fish lay their eggs with intermediates that's in a mop versus honeycombs that's in a cave. You would take those eggs out into a basket and hatch them out. It's, you know, just a little bit of aeration and they're just fine. Once they hatch, I prefer to call them stage one fish. This is right after they hatch. This is not a universal number. This is just what I use to categorize my fish. After about a week, they turn into what I call a stage two fish. These stage two fish have gotten color, not their pattern, not their adult color pattern, but they are not clear fish anymore. After about a month and a half, 
they turn into a stage three fish. That's when they get their adult coloration. Keep in mind, they're still less than an inch long. However, they look just like the adults. And woodcats take about eight months for them to really get to what I think is a good selling size. The ones I have here are well over a year old. Okay, now, funnel that. So, this is a tank. It's a 10 gallon brand new aquarium tank. This is what I do. I over filtrate my tank so I make sure to have two sponges. I do like to have separate air pumps, but that's not always the case. I provided one air pump here. Uh, two sponges. I do not have a fish room. They are scattered around my parents' house, so I need to have a heater in every tank. I actually have a photo of a five gallon tank on a toilet because I was out of space. <laughs> So, um, these are pretty simple caves. These are one inch diameter plexo caves in a couple variety, squares, circles, and this is a D cave. I've never used a D cave, but after getting that one donated for this talk, I'm gonna go buy some tomorrow. They're very nice. And th this is the setup I would use for honey pumps. You know, some airline, air pump, like I said, lid, and that is the most basic honey pump setup. This tank with these supplies, as well as a group of three pairs of honeycombs, so six fish, is actually going to be given away at the end of this talk. Also for intermediates, intermediates are slightly larger fish, so they use larger caves. Watering spikes, or for those of you familiar with the aquarium co-op products, the co-op pleco cave works great. Those are the two caves I use. Also, spawning mops. Like I said, great solution for plants. These cost almost nothing, they're really easy. Those will be given away with the intermediates. Now, the giveaway is sponsored by Star Jumpers Tank in the Catfish Den. And that's about it. That concludes my talk. And so what I'm going to do here is if you would like to enter the giveaway, there's little slips of paper and pencils on the table. You can come up here, write your first, last name, phone number, and put it in the respective bucket. There's a photo on the two buckets. And uh, if you want them, they're going to be given away. However, I must say, do not enter the honeycomb one to get a free 10 gallon tank. These are live fish. After this, if you do not feel like you can meet the care requirements, don't enter the giveaway. And now I believe it's time for uh, questions. And we can sign up while the question yes. and answer period. Awesome. Answer as many questions as you want, and then when you're ready, just come up and fill out the little piece. What of paper. age did you 